The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as religion, sports, aviation, business, literature, and politics. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is the Dean of the Democratic Congressional uh, Group in Congress, Congressman Charles B. Rangel of the 15th Congressional District in Harlem. Reporting for duty, sir. Uh, all right. <laughs> Sergeant Rangel. All right. All right. Okay, this is the week of the Republican National Convention, and uh, a lot of things are happening in the city, including bad traffic, lots of protests, and lots of people standing up for issues they believe in. So as we go into the 2004 Congress, uh, presidential congressional campaign, what do you think are the key issues? Which issues do you think should be at the top, and which issues do some of the other folks think should be at the top? Three issues. The war, the war, and the war. I'm surprised you didn't say the economy. If you're dead, the economy doesn't count. And in this particular war, it's being fought by children other than the politicians' children. All of the statistical data will show you that. Unlike you and the Tuskegee Airmen who were so anxious to prove that you could fight against the Axis and fight for democracy and come back and enjoy it, this is not what this army's all about. This army comes from young kids that come from rural areas, inner cities, trying to be able to get a job, send a check back home, get a decent education, or reservists who felt that they're prepared to put out floods and fires and do what they have to do, or National Guard people. But now they're on the front lines and they're dying, thousands of them, it's in the hospitals. And the president is say, bring them on. You know, I threw out the draft there just to try to get the nation to kind of think of, you're not supposed to put young people in harm's way unless there's some evidence that your nation is threatened. And so it just seems to me, I'd like to talk about health care and jobs and a variety of other things, but at the end of the day, we don't know where this incumbent president is prepared to take our nation. Just recently he said that he didn't think we can win the war on terror. You know what? I agree with him. You cannot bomb people that hate you and you're not even asking the reasons. We don't know. You knew the Germans, you knew the Japanese, you knew the Italians. If you were the commander in chief and I was to ask, if I was to tell you, guess what, General Brown? I have just found intelligence that the terrorists want to surrender. You wouldn't even know where the hell to go. You wouldn't know what they look like, what country they're in, because unfortunately, this president has alienated people from all over the world, and the terrorists are completely around us. Now, the <clears throat> Democratic Party has some responsibility for this because they did vote to give this president this authority to launch this war against the terrorists after 9-11, which as we all know was a terrible, terrible event. It's a, and in some ways it's a question of things that you didn't think were going to happen happen because you weren't prepared. But now that we see what happened in 9-11 report that we did make some mistakes. The question is, how, why did we get into this, and how, when can we get out of it? And I think that's the key question that the presidential candidate John Kerry has to face. How are you going right. to get out of this now that we're in it? Uh, I think most Americans pretty much believe that we shouldn't have been in Iraq. We should have been fighting the people who destroyed the World Trade Towers, but who were they? We went to Afghanistan, we got some of them out of there, but now we are in Iraq trying to democratize Iraq, which itself is very split, and the question is, how? what is the exit strategy? As a matter of fact, that's the key question, and unfortunately, if you want to take the democratic perspective, uh, John Kerry has not given us a way out. Well, 
I think it's clear that long before Bush was elected, there were a group of people that had decided that they were to take out Saddam Hussein, and this was before 9-1-1. Is that because of oil or because of some ideological issue? I would think that if oil was not there, the issue never would have been on the table. I would think that the question of survival of Israel was a priority. I would think that the arrogance of these people in believing that not only that we were a world power, but anyone who disagreed with us should be taken mm -hmm. out. And this type of language is constantly used, even by Giuliani, which side are you on? Mm -hmm. And if you look like a terrorist and you act like a terrorist, and what is that? That means that you, you, you're not Jewish, you're not Christian, you're not European. These people have been demonized since I was a kid. And if you can't talk with them, if they're prepared just to kill you without going to a European type of discussion table, they would say, I don't know which one of these people are responsible for what's going on, but there's one of them that's got a big mouth and he's evil. Mm -hmm. Now that's what the president keeps saying. Well, there are a lot of evil people in this world. But the question's got to be, do you go to war for each and every one of them? What I really think happened, uh, Roscoe, is that when we were hit at 9 -1 -1, most of Americans didn't give a damn who did it. We wanted to get even. Revenge. Revenge. It happens on Lenox Avenue. Someone came from another neighborhood and hurt somebody in Harlem, and they said they came from East Harlem. You don't ask specifically who did it. You got to teach him a lesson. You got to, and the president says it. If you harbor one of them, if you don't turn them in, we got to treat you like you are them. And I, when they, when he was told by Tenet that if you take out Saddam Hussein, it will teach a lesson to anyone who listens to Saddam Hussein. And the president was bright enough to say, do you really think we can do it? After all, they got the biggest army in the Middle East, and uh, what about the rest of the countries? And, and he asked all of these questions, and Tenet said, it's a slam dunk. You take him out, and you are a hero to the world. Here's a guy that tried to kill his father. Here's a guy that didn't know up and down in foreign policy. And to think that you can save Israel, secure oil, and knock out Saddam Hussein with one shot. But what happened? Have you ever driven or been willing to admit that you were driving to the airport and you're driving a rental car by mistake <laughs> and you get in there and these big spikes come in behind you and you got to be humble enough to tell the guy, I've made a mistake. mistake. I got to get out of here. And that's where I think Kerry. I think he made a big mistake in trusting the president and giving him the authority and thinking that he was going to use it as leverage with the United Nations and collectively to convince not just in losing our European friends, but to let the Egyptians and the Saudis and the Syrians and the Iranians know they got a problem with these people. And you got to talk with them and we got to work this thing out. You can't bomb your way to victory with people that have problems that go over a thousand years. And I think that the removal of Bush and a fresh face, you don't have to get permission to respect someone and to discuss an issue with dignity, to point out that we have to deal with the Palestinian question, the Israeli question, we have to deal with equity. You know, you don't say you're superimposing democracy on Saudi Arabia and Egypt, but you have to let them know we got to change the rules of the game with, a, with something of mutual respect. And we can't have the whole world in jeopardy because of your inability to work. I think mm -hmm. that Kerry will be able to do that. Well, the American public has to be convinced of this. When you look at the polls, it's about half and half. About 10% of the people are not sure. And I go back to the economy. I, I understand and agree with your analysis of the Iraqi situation, the war, but what affects the average working person in Ohio or in West Virginia or in Indiana is what's coming across 
the paycheck, what's coming across the table. And the economy has deteriorated, partially because of the war and partially because of the tax cut that the Republican administration put through. The question I asked you as a professional politician, the dean of the Democratic congressional contingent, is how do you get this message across to the average citizen who doesn't know the nuances of the war in Iraq? How do you get that message across? I think it's getting across. I, I look at this not as a professional, but as a situation where it's a battered wife and the country is the battered wife and the president is the batterer. And here we are at a time of war, and you're asking the wife to say, why don't you leave him? You know, you lost all of your jobs, your health insurance. Uh, he's lost all of the friends that you used to have. Why don't you just walk out and leave him? And the wife would say, you know, he's going to change, or we do have hard times. I can't walk out on him now. He is the commander in chief. But you know what happens in these situations? One day the guy just walks home and he forgets to bring home the milk. <laughs> and she starts saying, which I think Amaris got to say, you know, there was a time before I met you, I had a job, my kids were going to college, I had health insurance, I had hopes for the future. There was peace. Minorities were actually moving into the, uh, into the uh, middle class incomes. Poverty was going down. But then I went along with you or at least somebody went along with you. And what the heck did you do? You went off and told me that we're gonna get involved in a war to end all wars, and you're running around saying that you don't even know whether we can win. We lost a thousand of my, maybe they're not immediate to me, but a thousand Americans are there. You don't know how we gotta get out. I am through with you. And I don't think that voters like talking that way. I don't really think that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat and you see American lives being lost, that you feel good, I don't, in taking a shot at the guy saying that, I say Rumsfeld should resign. They say, well, why don't, why don't you say the president could? I can't work myself mm -hmm. up to say the president should resign. After all, he wasn't even elected. And so that process went through the courts. People say, well, why isn't Kerry doing better? Well, I wish he was go doing better, but I think we're going through this period where everyone just mm -hmm. feels just down and sad. I have not seen anyone proud of the Bush record. I have not heard anything at the convention that any of the professionals can evaluate that you can walk out there saying, I am glad I'm with the president, and I know the next four years is going to be just as good. This has been a lousy four years for the world. I've been all over the world like you have, and you and I know that there's a whole lot in our country mm -hmm. that should be corrected. And yet, I've never felt ashamed of my country, no matter where I was, because I felt like with you as a Tuskegee Airman, if you can love this country enough to fight and almost die for it, it means that you had hope and confidence in this country, not any other country. It wasn't like Paul Robeson who had to leave in order to find his way. You had confidence we could do it. I had confidence I could come back from Korea. And kind of people felt that as rough as things were for you, they respected you because you were an American and had that hope. That is shattered, that is gone. And we won't regain that in our lifetime. How could, a, how could a person do that to our country? And I am saying that whether you're Republican or conservative, you can't feel good about yourself. I heard Giuliani at the National Republican Convention say, oh, they defame him, they talk about him, uh, they say terrible things, but that's not going to stop him. I hope before I die, you will never have to defend me that way in saying, that no, what, no matter what they say about me, I'm a decent guy. That's terrible. Well, the election will be in November. We're concerned about whether the votes will count this time. Uh, in the Congress, what have 
you folks been doing to make sure that we have votes that count? For example, some people say it ought to be done on a computer. But unless you have a paper trail, you don't know whether the computer is going to be jigged. So what about this? How confident are any, you that uh, the votes are going to be counted correctly? I'm not that confident. And uh, the problem is that this is not a new problem. This is an old problem. Uh, under the Electoral College system, the popular vote really doesn't count. And most Americans don't know that. And the only reason that this atrocity and this theft, and these, these thefts happen with Republicans and Democrats in local and cities and states all over the country for centuries. What made this so important? What made this so important, it really got down to the line. We in just one state, Getting those electoral college votes made the difference. The 549 popular votes. That's all it took. And when Jeb Bush says not to worry about it, bro, I'm going to get it for you. you <laughs> know, they, the, the president's <laughs> brother. <laughs> and they accused, you know, when, when Kennedy had this close race with Nixon and they said that Kennedy's father called Daly and said, we're behind. He you says, get how, the many vote, to how many votes do you need? <laughs> And the truth is that as long as you're dealing with the Electoral College vote, then it means that we have about 15 states. Forget the rest of them. Mm -hmm. Because as lousy as their voting system is, the winner would get such a plurality that the loser can't contest mm -hmm. it. But when it gets down to the wire, that it could go either way, then the system is tested. And where is the system the weakest? in the poorest of the communities. And why? Because people have to give priorities. Do you want a real good election system that you use once every four years, or do you want a hospital and a school, or do you want decent housing? So at the end of the priority is the mach machinery that provides for a system. And even though in New York City and state, we have greatly improved the quality of those who work for the Board of Election, I am old enough to remember, <laughs> if you couldn't get a guy a job doing anything, you sent him to the Board of Election. Thank God they've upgraded that. This then means that there's a lot of education that needs to take place. Um, programs like ours, things that are on the media, things in the newspaper, things in the nation. The public needs to be educated. Um, the electoral college system really needs to be changed. Is there any possibility that the Electoral College system can be changed, which was set up when the Constitution was formed to keep the Southerners in line? Is there any possibility that you guys can change that? Let me get back to your first question, <laughs> Doctor, and say, which is easier. Education is key to survival. People can't afford the luxury in saying that it really doesn't make a difference. We have historically overused the cliché vote like your life depends on it. I think the peace of the whole world is being determined about how America is going to be perceived. God has either damned us or blessed us with all of the power and technology that we have, not only to survive, but to assist other nations to live as friends and as trading partners or to build up the type of capabilities that we can destroy each other. And now we're not dealing just with nations, we're dealing with people who hopeless believe that we are the evil ones and they have been trained to hate us as we are now building up the same type of animosity. We need someone at this time screaming out, even our spiritual leaders to assist us in saying, we owe it to the generations to follow to save this earth. Having said that, when it gets to the electoral college vote, we cannot debate this in terms of the theft in Florida or what happens in November, we have to go back exactly to what you were saying. Why was it there in the first place? Why would a place like Rhode Island have two electoral college votes when they can only elect one member of Congress? And this would go on with Montana and Vermont and Delaware what makes all of the states so darn equal? Well, coming from a big state, I don't want to hear the other <laughs> argument, you know? 
I don't want to have two senators from Rhode Island beat me mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. when here I represent 650,000 people and they represent 400,000, and I have to debate why they get two senators and all the guys get is me. But in order to get these states together, in order to get an agreement, a contract had to be there. And they were able to say to you who represent the people, if you're so carried away with your plurality and the people are gonna rule, let them rule in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. But we don't want you big guys to get so big that you forget that we're states too. And if it's going to be done by population, you don't even have to talk to them. You don't even visit with them. You ask, who are they? How do they get involved to be called states? But if they're able to say, you may forget me in the House of Representatives, but when you get to the Senate, I am your equal. It's a hard argument. And that is the reason why they tried to bring this balance between let what we say in the House of Representatives, the people govern. I don't know what they say on the other side in the Senate, but you know, it's called a club. It's a hundred of them. And it only takes 51 to And there have only been three people of color in the club. How about Obama? Yeah, well, Obama, he's, gonna he's, gonna be an he's exciting new Obama member. is coming, that's right. Yeah. Now, let's talk about, uh, as we come to the close of today's program, let's talk about involvement of African-Americans in the political process. Many of them, practically every African-American, sees the Democratic Party as their savior. But then they say the Democratic Party uses African-Americans when it's convenient and forgets about them when the main issues come down, and that some of us ought to become Republicans. What's your answer to that? I really wish that that hypothetical would be true. And I tell you, when Nelson Rockefeller was governor. Mm -hmm. I had my hearing aid on mm -hmm. and working because he was talking the way Republicans should talk. And they were saying the same thing, except Nelson was saying, let me prove to you why I can show you a better political mm -hmm. life. I was not born with a Democratic label tattooed on my behind. I was born in a society where I knew that if I wanted to serve my people, I had to make options as to which was the best vehicle. When the Democratic Party can only come up with Don King as their national leader, and he's a great fight promoter, but if you he's mean, the guy you that's... Mean the Democratic Party or Republican Party? Republican Party, yeah, okay. yeah right. Republican Party. Don King is now supporting, you know. Oh, he's the and then lead. we got a guy named Roy Ennis. I don't know where Roy comes from or what he does, but he, you know. And then I look at the House of Representatives we used to have a guy named Watts, a black guy from J. Oklahoma, J.C. Watts, Watts. Quarterback from Oklahoma. Right. And I used to say, you know, on the floor of representatives, God bless J.C. Watts, the football player, because if the Republicans ever lost him, they would lose the entire Republican black caucus. And guess what? <laughs> they, they lost, lost him. him. So there's not one minority over there. I used to say, and Ben Gilman, my Jewish friend from upstate New York, is the only Jewish member they have there. If he leaves, someone said, hold it. We got Mr. Cantor, he's a Jewish guy from Virginia. I said, sorry. So they got one Jewish guy. I think they got two Latinos. If you were going to apply to a club, it's not that you want everyone to look like you, but you want to know how they're going to treat you. And I'm not saying that these club rules should not be changed. There is so much room for improvement within the Democratic Party. But to leave where you can make change, to join a club where there is no notice on the door that you're invited, why start from the beginning? I cannot think of one Republican, and I like a lot of them, that has ever made an offer that I could tell a young guy, look, my career has been in the Democratic Party, but why don't you take advantage of the offers that's there? Because the true nature of things and, and the competitive nature of it, if I were a good Republican and you were a good Democrat, only our people could be the beneficiary as we compete as to who's going to give them the best opportunity. And of course, the Congressional Black Caucus, 
which is what, 39? 39 African-American mm, men who, and women. Who have sometimes veto power over certain kinds of legislation. And let's talk about chairmanships as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, when the Democrats take over the uh, House of Representatives, Charles B. Rangel will be the head of the Ways and Means Committee. John Conyers. And that's, you have no vested interest in this election, <laughs> but it's very important to you. <laughs> and the keeper of the Constitution and the judgeships of judiciary is John Conyers. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's an exciting opportunity, but I, I see this. Don't just cave into the Democrats and just say eh, that that they take you for granted. You got to shake them. You got to move them. You got to make demands. People say, well, "How could you be a good Democrat and support Sharpton? Sharpton makes me look good." I mm -hmm. tell them in a minute, "Hey, I'm trying to work this out." But well, we got a whole lot of people that will make Sharpton look like one of the most civil, level-headed guys you want to see. And didn't he make us proud mm -hmm. at the convention? He certainly did. And, of course, Charles B. Rangel from the 15th Congressional District in Harlem makes us proud every day. We want to thank you, Charlie, for being with us on today's African-American Legends. And the folks say, give them hell, Charlie. You're my hero. <laughs>